All right, boys and girls, Mr. Mark back with another video on, believe it or not, physics. This is actually one of the most important lessons that we're going to have all year because it relates to forces, and forces are a really big deal in physics. It's how objects interact. So this may be a little bit lengthy because we're going to talk about some different kinds of forces, and then we're going to learn a new skill how we draw forces, but kind of hang with me on this. Um, first of all, a simple definition of a force. Force is basically just a push or a pull. So you push something, you exert a force on something. You kick something, you've exerted a force on it. You pull it, etc., etc. The symbol that we use to represent a force is a capital F, F for force. And the unit that we measure forces in is called a Newton, which is given the symbol capital N. The Newton's named after a guy by the name of Isaac Newton, who you may have heard of. So because forces have a direction, that means that they are vector quantities. So really we should write the force symbol F with a little vector arrow above it, like that. A force is an interaction between two objects. You can't have a force without something to apply the force. You can't have a force without something to receive the force. In other words, you can't push on nothing. And so a force requires two objects, and that's how objects interact with each other. Next big idea, forces can change the motion of an object. Well, for right now, we're just going to stick to examples where that doesn't happen. But later on down the road, we'll get into situations where motion is changing. That's going to be due to forces. And the way that we measure the size of a force is using a device called a scale. A scale is basically a spring that stretches out more when you pull it with more force, and so it gives us a visual indication of how big the force is. Lastly, some other units for force you may be familiar with are the pound and the ton. For instance, when you go to the doctor's office and they measure your weight, which is a force, they measure it using a scale, and they typically measure it in pounds unless you are a boat, in which case they may use tons. If you don't know, a ton is 2,000 pounds. So those are common units in everyday life for forces. So let's discuss some important forces. And what I might recommend that you do here is just kind of press pause. I'm going to put them all up here on the screen for you. This is the first of two slides on some important forces. And just kind of jot everything down, and then we'll kind of come, you know, press play, and we'll kind of come back through it um, and discuss one at a time after you've had a chance to kind of write down the information. So do that. Press pause, write down all the information, and then press play, and we'll go back through them one by one. Okay, so the is referred to as weight. The weight is given the symbol F subscript G because it's caused by gravity. And it's often referred to as the force of gravity. Weight is the force on an object due to its position in a gravitational field. Right now, you're in a gravitational field which is caused by the Earth. The important um, thing that are measurement here is the value of the gravitational field which has the symbol little g. Little g is a vector, and it represents the gravitational field. On Earth, the value of g is 9.8, and the unit is newtons per kilogram. That's approximately 10 newtons per kilogram, and typically you're allowed to round that off to 10 just to make calculations simpler and quicker. So to find the weight of something, we simply multiply the size of the gravitational field by the object's mass. M represents mass. The direction of weight is always directed downward. The Earth always pulls you down. Something that we kind of take advantage of, kind of take for granted, rather. The second important force is called the normal force, which has the symbol F subscript N. The normal force is the force exerted by a surface when something is pushing against it. It's referred to as the normal force, not because it's the opposite of weird, but because normal means perpendicular to a surface. So it's really, it's a math word. 
So you can be perpendicular to a line. The correct term when you're at a right angle to a surface is to say that it is normal. So for example, if you have a book sitting on a level table, the table is pushing it upwards. The force that that table exerts is called a normal force. Again, not the opposite of where normal means perpendicular. The third important force is called the force of friction. So typically, we give the symbol F with the subscript little f, F for friction force. This is the force between two surfaces which are pressed together, and it resists the relative motion of the surfaces. Basically, friction is trying to keep two surfaces from moving relative to each other. You kind of think about it almost like glue. It tries to keep the surfaces stuck. Friction always acts parallel to the surface. So, for example, if you're pulling a sled on a level ground to the right, then friction is going to pull the sled to the left. It's going to oppose the motion, and it's going to be parallel to the surface. Now we're going to learn a lot more about friction in more detail later on, but for right now that kind of gives us a place to start from. Some more important forces. You might want to do the same thing. Just press pause, write down all the information, then press play, and we'll go through it um, step by step. So press pause, write everything down, and then press play again. So the next important force that we've already kind of seen this year is the force of tension. Tension is given the symbol F subscript T, or sometimes we kind of just get rid of the F and just give it a capital T with a vector arrow above it, because oftentimes we're going to end up with multiple tensions in a given situation. Tension is simply the force that holds a string or rope or chain or anything like that together. Tension is a useful force because we can always figure out its direction just by following the string. If the string is going to the right, then the force must be to the right. It's not really very tricky. The next important force is the force exerted by a spring, which we're going to label F subscript S. So, Springs exert forces when they are stretched or compressed. Compressed means squeezed. Think about a rubber band. You stretch out a rubber band, it exerts a force trying to go back to its original relaxed state. Springs behave the same way. The amount of force that a spring exerts is proportional to the amount of stretch or compression in the spring. Just like a rubber band, the more you stretch it, the more force it exerts. This is why springs are useful for measuring forces. The direction that the spring force is in is always opposite the way the spring is stretched or pulled. So if you pull a spring to the right, it's going to try to pull back to the left. So it's opposite the way that it is stretched or compressed. Next important force is called drag which has a symbol F subscript D. Drag is often called air resistance, but that's kind of a bad term because it applies to more than just air. So drag is the force on an object that's moving through a fluid. Air and water are good examples of fluids. And it's a resistive force, meaning it's trying to slow something down. So it's kind of similar to friction in that it's always trying to keep something from moving, although it does obey different rules. The force of drag on an object is proportional to the area of the object and its velocity. So things that are really small or not moving too fast, or things that are dense, would have negligible drag on them. So for instance, we can throw a football across the classroom without really having to worry about drag. If we try to throw a paper airplane across the classroom, because the airplane has more surface area and is not as dense, then drag is going to become a, a bigger factor. The direction of drag is always such that it opposes the motion, so it's always opposite the velocity. Okay, so we know some um, specific forces. We're going to learn about more over the next few months. Let's talk about how we represent forces. The way that we represent forces graphically is in a, a diagram called a free body diagram. 
What a free body diagram, or FBD for short, does is it represents the forces on a single body. So single is like what means, or is um, free in this case. Body would be like an object at a time. So you draw the forces on one object at a time. That's why it's called a free body diagram. Forces are drawn as vectors starting from the object's center of mass. And typically when we draw the object, we draw them as simple shapes like tri or as um, rectangles, squares, or little dots. That's important. Remember when you draw vectors, you need to draw vectors to scale. Same thing here. So let's look at a simple example, very simple example. Let's suppose you've got a book sitting on a table. There's the book. So your first rule about drawing free body diagrams is to draw it as a box or a dot, a simple shape. Uh, otherwise, it's going to get confusing. And then draw the forces acting on it starting from its center. So there's two forces acting on a book that's sitting on a table. Book always has weight pulling it down. Be sure you label the forces, so that downward force I'm going to label F subscript G. And then a normal force pushing it back up. That's the force the table exerts. Make sure you draw them to scale. So two forces that have the same size should be drawn with the same length. And so I know that the force of gravity and the normal force are the same size because the book doesn't go up or down, it's at rest. I know the forces are balanced. Let's look at a few more examples. Suppose you go to the grocery store and you're pushing a shopping cart to the right at a constant speed. So you're navigating down the cereal aisle, slowly pushing your cart to the right. There's your cart. Think for a second, there's four forces that are acting on this cart. The obvious one is the force of gravity, weight. Cart's got weight, it's always going to pull it down. The next obvious one would be a normal force. The floor of the supermarket is holding up the cart, keeping it from plummeting straight to the center of the earth. That force would represent you pushing it forward. So in lack, for lack of a better term, I'll just call that F push. You can really give it any name you want to. It's a contact force. And then the next question is, what's trying to keep the cart from moving? What's holding it back? Well, shopping carts have those real bad wheels, so there's probably significant friction on the shopping cart. So I'm going to draw friction to the left. So again, notice that the up and down forces I've drawn to the same length, and the left and right forces I've drawn to the same length. I know to draw them to the same length because the velocity of this shopping cart is not changing. It's moving at a constant speed. Let's look at another example. Suppose you have a, a sign that's hanging from a rope. There's your sign. Signs obviously have weight. So the next question it is, is, what is holding this thing up? Well, it's a rope holding it up. So that would be a tension force. And again, forces are balanced. It's just hanging there. So you should draw them to the same length. So in all three examples that we did, the vectors were all the vectors that were going up were all equal to the vectors going down and the vectors that are going to the right were equal to the vectors going to the left in all three cases we knew that the forces were balanced meaning that the sum of the forces should be zero so forces right positive forces left negative add them up they add up to zero when the forces are balanced so, speaking of all this adding, last thing to cover today is a net force equation. The term net refers to the sum of something. So it's typically used in economics, money basically. If you spend $200 making stuff and then you sell it for $300, you've got a net profit of $100. It's the sum of what you spent, or excuse me, what you earned minus what you spent. Well, it's very similar for forces. The way that we symbolize the sum of something is with the Greek letter sigma. Sigma is kind of like a real blocky S-looking shape. It's not an E. Don't ever say that it is an E.
So when I say net force, that means sigma f represents the sum of the forces on an object. You can write a net force equation in both the horizontal and vertical directions. And this is going to end up being very useful in describing what's going on with an object and in solving problems. So the basic form looks like this. The net force in the y direction would simply be the forces that are going up minus the forces that are going down. Up positive, down negative. Net force in the x direction, basic form, would look like forces going to the right minus forces going to the left. Now this isn't always going to be hard and fast, but it does give us a place to start from. So let's go back to our examples and write a net force equation for each of those three examples. So just in your notes, flip back to where you drew those three free body diagrams real quick. So here's the book sitting on a table. We've got normal force going up and weight pulling it down. So my net force in the y direction equation would look something like normal force minus the force of gravity up minus down. There's no horizontal force, and so I'm just going to write the net force in the x direction as zero. Just a placeholder. Um, really, you wouldn't even write that in a real life situation. Our second example was the shopping cart example. Pushing a shopping cart to the right at a constant speed. So our net force in the y direction would look very similar. Normal force minus gravity. Our net force in the x direction, right minus left, will like the force of the push minus the force of friction. Our third example, a sign hanging from a rope. Here we have tension going up and gravity going down. So net force in the y direction will look something like tension minus weight. And there's no x forces, so I'm just going to write the net force in the x direction. So hopefully we can kind of get a basic understanding of how to draw a free body diagram and what they represent, and then some common forces that we're going to be encountering throughout the year. Obviously, we won't be experts in it just from this simple lesson on video, but we should be ready to get more involved with it next time in class. So that's the end of this lesson. We'll pick up where we left off here, and we'll look at some more examples, some real-life situations, like actual objects in front of us that we can draw free body diagrams for, and then start to get a deeper understanding. So, we'll pick this up when I see you in class. Good night.